All right, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Shetman. I am a second year uh, uh, MFA student um, here at Texas Tech. Um, I'm from Austin, Texas. I've been professionally looking to play for about seven, eight years now. The um, reason why I came to graduate school was to become a better artist. Um, within this time of working um, with clay, I've been professionally doing it for about seven years and I didn't feel like I was getting anywhere. Um, it was a whole lot of doing the same things but not necessarily um, achieving different results, just kind of getting the same thing over and over again. Um, so yes, yeah, so the intention of me coming to school was to try out different um, fire methods um, and focus on sculpture more so than um, making functional wear. So if I am uh, making crockery, soul, teaching classes was the biggest source of income, but what I was very passionate in making was not a viable source of income or a, um, like, continuing way of support. Um, so, conveniently, all my pieces are coming up together. Um, and I would like to talk about these ones on the pedestal first. So, uh, these pieces on the pedestal um, are more focused around uh, process. Uh, it's not so much like, this one's about my cat, this one's about my aunt, and this one's about this or that. It's more of the act of making them um, that I, I like to speak for themselves. So um, one thing that I enjoy about clay is that it's a very forgiving material um, in the sense of if you mess something up, you can either go with it a different way or you can recycle it or um, depending on certain firing techniques, you can inhibit um, a certain decoration or a feeling, a hue on into the piece. Um, with these works, it really, um, it, uh, it invokes uh, my, my making technique. So um, I find that I don't necessarily have a steady hand or let's say like the patience to truly commit to just one piece all in one go. So it's very difficult for me to kind of sit down and draw a picture or a portrait for three hours. That's just not necessarily how I enjoy working. Whenever I approach things like writing a letter, an essay, working with clay, um, or other artistic um, endeavors, or even just like daily tasks, it's one of those things of I'll kind of do something here, go over there and do something else. So it's a lot of things in the back burner that I come back to, um, to where whenever I come back to it, it's this uh, newfound appreciation, or I see something new in it, as opposed to devoting so much time into one thing, and then saying, all right, that's done, on to the next thing. It's a whole lot of doing a lot of different things. Um, actually, when I think about it, I, I'm, I read about like four books at a time, so it's like, well, maybe one chapter of this, one chapter of something else. But it's this continuous cycle of that's an activity, and then this is the process that goes into it. So uh, one thing about me as well is that I have very good uh, spatial acuity. So it's one of those things of once something has an established order to it, I'm really good about um, putting that back. So for example, moving into a place um, it's very difficult for me to be like, well, this is the cabinet that I'm going to put all the cups in, and then I'll put all my cups in there, or this will be the spice rack, or whatever. Um, but if I go into a place where all of that's already established, if I see in someone's refrigerator, like, these are where the comments are, here's where this is, here's where that is, it's very easy for me to um, go along with that established order. So, uh, with that said, it's easier for me to have things that are already created and then put them together in an arrangement and ensemble. So with these, uh, it's approaching making shapes with clay, but then what I really enjoy is kind of the catastrophe that goes along with it. So I'll approach it by, let's say, making 20 cups. 
Um, I've got an order for plates. Um, so I'll approach it with um, my skills around pottery. And then um, what I really enjoy are the couple pieces that go bonk, that go array. Because then I see there's something special about that, as opposed to it being in a line of things that are supposed to be a certain way. I find that they were not necessarily chosen, but they decided to not be within this grouping of things that are supposed to. So with all of those, I just put them together and create what I would like to call three-dimensional collages. So these were um, an assemble of um, making different shapes, uh, slab building, and then even having leftover slabs and kind of putting them on there. Um, stacking different thrown forms, slip casting, and then including that within there, even scraps of things that I've slip casted, um, just to create these different arrangements um, and what I would like to call three dimensional collages. Uh, I enjoy atmospheric firings. They um, are fairly unpredictable, but I think that holds an ending eye beauty to them because it's to the mercy of the flames for them to reveal how they should look as opposed to me having a steady hand, making them look as I think they should. I let them be as they are. Um, then with that, you get a lot of different dynamics. Um, some spots you get a little bit more action, some spots are drier, sometimes you get flashing, but there's um, really just a lot of chance that goes along with it. And um, I see it as a blessing to where when a piece does look very nice, um, it's chosen that enigmatic beauty for that piece. Um, so yeah, these are the pieces on pedestals. I'm glad they're all together today. They're happy with the family. Um, <laughs> and then we've got my performance piece over here. Uh, this is uh, titled uh, Strangs of Sisyphus. Uh, this was a piece um, that was my final for uh, Dr. Warren Burrow's uh, performance class. <laughs> Um, this is me trying to move a mass of, I'm, I'm guessing it's about 600 pounds of clay. Um, so what went into this was um, me going over to uh, Post, Texas, so an hour south of here, and digging up clay, um, processing it, putting it through. Um, and the thing about that clay is it's humbled me in a sense, because it, doesn't work very well in, in making pottery. Um, it doesn't have enough technical term flux in it. So whenever you fire it, it doesn't liquefy and hold together. It becomes very brittle and just kind of crumbles on you. So then this made me take a step back of my, um, my uh, profession in pottery was a lot of clay comes from a bag, but I guess it came from the earth somewhere. You make a pot and you fire it, you sell it. That's the cycle of clay, that's the cycle of pottery. But approaching this clay, it was the step back of, actually, this is earth material. Um, whenever I was using this clay and processing it, and kind of just letting it sit, things started growing out of it, little sprouts. Um, whenever I first uh, dug up, actually, this batch, um, there were ants in there, and then I had a little ant farm for, you know, a little bit. And that's one of those things of, it's this, claiming over nature, over these earth materials that I feel that potters are inhibiting themselves with it. So um, a comment on this piece is uh, it was this visible struggle of man over material or more so claiming over the earth, but then it's incredibly futile. And I feel like that's where the um, Sisyphusian experience goes along with it. Um, and to go even farther with that, this piece was exhausting. Um, with a lot of digging things up, processing it, moving around. Every time that I did this piece as well, I was physically sore for days. Um, and doing the final performance um, during first Friday in May, it was um, also a mental anguish that went along with it. It was one of those things of, I prepared for this, I asked people to come, and, um, and in the end I felt like an absolute failure, and I felt like this piece was an absolute failure. Um, and 
it was just one of those things of exhausting yourself for something that just felt like it just wasn't even worth it in the end. And I expressed this um, frustration with one of my friends, and her response was, well, it sounds like you had a Sisyphusian experience. <laughs> and it was at that moment it just blew my mind to where, sure, there's an act of utility with action um, within this performance, but it was me realizing that the performance itself was that Sisyphusian experience more so than the display of it being so. Um, so, yeah, um, here are the remnants of the clay. Uh, it was me wondering what I was going to do with it as well, but I think it looks great crumbled up underneath the projection of it. Um, so yeah, um, these are my pieces. Um, thank you all for coming and being a part of this. And I'm to open up for questions. Yes. So um, within a kiln, there's different fuel sources that you can heat the kiln up with. Um, anything that can make something hot can be used as a fuel source. Um, so with that, there's a certain residue that might come from it, so like carbon, things like that. Whenever you uh, fire with wood, there's minerals within the wood that inherently escape through and then go throughout the kiln. So it's within the, the chamber of the kiln, there's an atmosphere. And then this can um, uh, create a bunch of minerals that's either within the wood or the combustible material. Um, you can also introduce things into the kiln chamber as well um, that will vaporize and then kind of just like hug onto the, whatever's around there. So in other words, you're like vaporizing some material and then it becomes this layer of glass over it. This can be either salt, um, soda ash, sodium bicarbonate, um, different things like that. So, Mark, on the more conceptual end of things, um, I have a question. First, I want to ask you specifically like, when you were not satisfied with how this piece worked, what, what had been your expectation? Too high. High in like which direction? You know? Like what did you think? So you know, there's, there's a huge difference between like theater and the role of the audience and, and how performance works in relation to people. Mm -hmm. What expectation did you have beyond being high? Like, what were you thinking would happen? Um I guess people picking up on the concept of that. Um, or there being a little bit more um, of intellectual depth or kind of picking up of like, oh, you know, the, there was an essay that I was already um, going along with it. Um, and also just the struggle. For the most part, I, I kind of enjoy this as just a video installation more so than an audience there. So I was um, deciding if I wanted the, the very well recorded uh, performance at um, First Friday, or if I wanted this. And honestly, I, I wasn't a huge fan of the audience being around there and their reaction. I wanted more just to be the act of doing this. So it could have existed, you doing it alone, or yeah, like whoever happened to be there, not as a like a performance in a sense of time event with audience. And that's actually some of the considerations I have with this piece as well. Of bringing all of this clay back to the spot that I dug it up. Because it was actually within a slope in the hill that the highway cut through, and then maybe even possibly trying to like push that up that hill. Mm -hmm. um, and there being a recording of that when the person passing by um, on the highway. Um, yeah, I feel like there's uh, there's more application to this, like it could be more site specific. Um, but I enjoy uh, it being in a white wall. As well, because it was real messy. I love it. Um, which is that kind of yeah. So, thank you. So, that leads me to the question that I think has to do with like, how do these relate to each other? Like, I think if we walk into this room and don't see labels, we're not necessarily going to think, oh, the person that 
broadly expensive way of entering into this is also doing these. And a common is that even though I find these to be very playful and um, you are sort of breaking the rules of, that come along with the technical skill you have as a actually a production potter, it's really just consistency, right, is essential. A high technical skill able to produce predictably a high quality object. You do seem to be suspending that, but then it's sort of not really in a way. It's sort of like you're still like, there still seem to be kind of narrow parameters to the range of unexpectedness. Whereas when you go in here, like we're off on a whole other, like way far away. So like how is it that you're doing these very different things in your work? And what do you see like them doing together as you move forward from Setting here. Um, I guess you'd say it's uh, getting away from the comfort zone. Like, the, this was kind of just like dabbling and stepping out just a little bit, and then this is just jumping head first into the muddy puddle um, of, uh, yeah, of, of what uh, I guess I've always been attuned to do. I'll be fascinated to see what. what yeah, 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 that's a question. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. So, I'm curious, you talked about um, being a production potter and sort of fitting a wall and maybe some, uh, the next step conceptually. Is that, am I not sure you that correctly? Yes. So, um, so, I'm just wondering if you could sum up for us, like, what did you learn in your first year conceptually that's brought your work from the production potter world into the MFA program. Uh, I, That's kind of a weird on the spot thing. I'm just curious how you see that. Honestly, the fact that there should be some conceptual depth to it. Um, coming into this program, I. Uh, but you knew that because that's what you can. Exactly. Um, and, and that's the thing is, I guess I've never really been challenged so much of like why people asking that question. It's like, well, because you can drink out of it or you can, I don't know, this or it just looks cool, you know? Um, and I feel like that's the biggest challenge here, is stepping away from, well, it has some inherent use to it, so that's the why, but then also coming here of um, why should someone look at it, and honestly, why should someone care? And I feel like that's uh, the power um, through an artist is inhibiting that um, into a piece. So first year was the biggest challenge of like, Things should have, should be conceptual, should have depth to, um, um, so, so it has that validity, so it has um, strength to it as opposed to it just existing. But you know, you, don't, you can't make it because like lose that on. Exactly. Right, so you've got to kind of, you got to have the concept or the ideas in your head as you're making the piece or somehow. So I want to um, go back. Andrew um, you mentioned uh, theater in relation to your performance piece. The question I'm going to ask might seem like ancillary to your primary interest in, in play, I think, but I'm curious to know more about your choice to costume yourself this way in this video. Obviously, it makes a direct reference to depictions of Sisyphus from like growth painting within the canon, but I, like as you were describing our and excavating this play from the earth and the post, and as I'm watching your video, I'm wondering like, you know, how, how the narrative that experience of the piece has changed by, you know, like why didn't you wear the thing that you wore that day, I guess, or how is it different than the way that you are um, posed in your studio? Can you tell us about the, the costume now? The, the costume was entirely through depictions of Sisyphus. So I, I wanted to be um, obvious of like, oh, you know, someone who is forever in eternity doing this. So he's simply in a point block, which I imagine is like, used to be in a toga, and then weathered through eternity, there, you know, that's what's left. Um, so it was entirely that. Um, I feel like it wouldn't be appropriate if I just wore my messy studio clothes and just kind of pushing it. Um, 
that would be an approach for it. Um, but more so, I wanted like um, visual representations of Sisyphus to be what I was um, modeling. Yeah, it's, it's just interesting um, to me. It's just an aspect of, of the piece. I would say that the, the task that you're performing is so um, profoundly Sisyphean, but uh, that, that's why I, I mean, sort of, um, my mind goes to, to how the costume builds upon that or, or right, it's locates it um, painfully in, in those images. And that's not me recommending that you do this piece in it. I sort of hear performance and um, at first Friday, and so I did experience the audio. I actually forgot about that um, part of it, and I know there are headphones there. Um, but does that is is it integral um, to the, the, the full and deep experience of, of this piece that people take in the the, the your recitation of that um, at the poem? I'd say it, uh, it definitely adds a level of, of depth to it, um, but within the act of the performance, it, it does get drowned out by grunts and slaps and just kind of moving things around. Um, yeah, but upon reading that essay, and I'm also reading Camus, it was, um, it was like, oh yeah, this is a, more so than just a myth and a story, this is a concept. Um, and that was something I wanted to portray as opposed to just push it a bunch of way around. Is it okay if it's sometimes funny? Because some of it, some of it, I laugh at. When you're running and your legs are slipping, it's supposed to be pretty much a cartoon. Okay. Yeah. Um, something that I'm interested in is like, especially with this piece, like thinking about failure, especially looking at the pots and you talking about like kind of having a memory palace about placement of things and like recognizing that and then like seeing these works, they're not orderly in a way, they're disorderly. And so like, I don't know, there's something interesting in that sort of um, tension between like this sort of control that you have in the world normally and then what you allow to happen in these and then you're talking about failure in this piece like I love works that talk about failure because it's so human and real like Felix Gonzalez Torres's two lovers the, the clocks that don't ever completely match up like it's like have you thought about failure in your work but, um and like what does that mean to you and also like um what was I gonna say about this one um, there's something interesting too about how you talk about materiality and you were thinking about material these materials in a specific way and then you really went to the materials in that and like you recognized the sort of um, responsibility you have as a ceramicist to recognize the materials and come to terms with them and you did that in that and so like so I guess talk about failure and materiality boom <laughs> that's my questions but this is actually a discussion I either yesterday or the day before. Um, and she's like, I don't think you recognize exactly that that you just, that you just shared. It's, uh, the, I guess it's me coping with the possibility of failure and embracing as opposed to getting hung up on things passing or um, beating myself up about mm -hmm. failure. Um, yeah. And then the, the next question was materiality. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it just took me coming to grad school to, I guess, reconceptualize what clay means to me. Yeah. Um, does that answer your question? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, like, I worked with, there was furniture design in my grad program, and, like, one thing that they realized coming to that program was, like, the, how they grappled with material. Because, like, yes, they're furniture designers and they make furniture. Like, okay, well, can I think about the material that I'm using and so like I think grad school did push you to really think about because a lot of times like we make something and we don't think about how it's supposed to exist we're just in our discipline but you're kind of like going back to like okay why does it have to exist as clay or what is my relationship to clay and I think I don't know I think there's some, something more to pull from there because like you presented a very intimate relationship with clay and recognizing that and I don't think a lot of ceramicists sort of think about that so yeah. what also like how
Hillary's point, Hillary's point about um, failure and materiality also helps you connect the two sides of your world, right? Which Andrew was asking. Cool. Any last questions before we move on? Okay, one last question. Have you considered these to be like the disruption of Earth and how the material of Earth actually deals with the lack of symmetry that's created by putting something unexpected? Um, I mean, humanity does that all the time. Yeah, no, I, I haven't thought about it that way. Um, uh, definitely, uh, that there's there's agency and entropy with everything in materials. With um, I mean, especially observing uh, this clay and using this material, it's uh, I mean even the canyon systems that this clay came from, there, there's a constant change and it eroding and then maybe even creating more um, uh, faces or precipices that this can be dug up from. But that's not to say that that's wrong but then it's also thinking is us having this control over that material unnatural or is it us um, using it to make something that should be um, so no i don't really thought about that um, but thank you for asking okay cool well thank you